Part 1 In this test, you will hear a number of different recordings and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you will have a chance to check your answers. In the IELTS listening test, the recording will be played once only. The test is in four sections. In the exam, you will be advised to write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the test, you will have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. You are going to listen to a conversation between two friends who are discussing the organization of a party. As you listen, answer the questions. Write no more than three words for each answer. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now the test will begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Hi, Matt. Right on time. Have you been waiting long? Mm, five minutes. The buses were held up on the high street. Otherwise, I would have been early. Yeah, there's something wrong with them today. Yes, I think so. OK, what should we do? Should we go and have a coffee? Yeah, that would be nice. There's that place on the corner over there. It does really nice coffee and cakes and things, and at this time it's usually very quiet, so we'll be able to talk. OK, let's go there then. So, when's the party going to be? Well, it has to be at the end of September, before we all leave for university. We've plenty of time, then. We don't go for another five weeks, do we? Hmm. Well, we haven't really got that much time, if you think about it. There are only a couple of weeks at the beginning of September when all of us are around. Oh, yes, I forgot. Nazrin, Phil and Nicky and all that lot have gone off on holiday. And I'm away for two weeks from tomorrow. So, what does that leave us, then? As far as I know, we're all here between the 19th and the 30th of September. Will Sandra be around then? I know that she has a whole string of family birthdays at that time, and she might not be available. Hmm. Well, let's make a note of that, and we can contact her about it. OK. Shall we settle for the 21st of September, then? What day is the 21st? It's a Saturday. Is that OK? That's fine. Before the conversation continues, look at questions 6 to 10. As you listen to the second part of the conversation, answer questions 6 to 10. For these questions, there are three alternatives, A, B and C. Decide which alternative is the most suitable answer 
and circle the correct letter. And now for the tricky bit. Where are we going to hold it? Well, I spoke to Nikki last week and she volunteered her place as they have a huge house and garden. Oh, fantastic. Will her parents be around? Yeah, I think so, but she said they won't mind. Oh, right. Well, my parents wouldn't like it at all. <laughs> Nor mine. <laughs> but is it definite? Yes. When I spoke to her, she said it was definitely on. I'll just have to confirm the dates with her. We thought it would be one weekend in September, so I'll just have to make sure that that one is OK. One thing Nikki suggested, we could have a daytime party, as we could be outside if the weather is fine. Oh, wow. How far out does she live? It's not that far. Do you know where West Road crosses the bridge? Yeah. It's the first house on the right, with that huge drive up to the front door. Oh, right. I know exactly where it is. The road is off the A33 and runs north, then over the bridge and first on the right. I know it. Ah, oh, the place is amazing. You know it has a big swimming pool. Does everyone know where she lives? Most of her friends do, but not all. But it doesn't matter, as we can put this map Nicky sent me in with the invitation. How shall we do the invitation? We can do it on the computer. I can scan the map and we'll put it all onto an A4 page. Is this the address? Can I just write the address down? It's 93 West Road, and I'll take the phone number. It's 477130. Right. There's one other thing. Yes? We're all giving £10 towards refreshments and food. There'll probably be a barbecue. Do you think that's enough? Oh, right. Yeah, that's fine. And everyone will have to help tidy up afterwards, including the boys. <laughs> that is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear a tutor talking to a group of philosophy students. First, look at questions 11 to 13. For these questions, complete the blank spaces in the table as you listen to the first part of the talk. Write no more than two words for each answer. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Dr. Russell, and I am your tutor for philosophy this year. I think we're all here. Let's see. Five, six, seven. Yes, that's everyone. Before we look at the three lectures you've had on philosophy this week, I would just like to run through a few things about what you can expect of me as tutor and what in turn we expect of you. As for myself, my function as tutor is to help you in all things relating to your work in the philosophy course. The help that I am able to give is, of course, mainly academic. For personal matters, I can refer you to other support services in the university, ranging from counselling to um, welfare. One thing that I would point out is that if you feel that you need to talk to someone, no matter how insignificant it is, don't leave it. Oh, and the last thing is, if you do need to make an appointment, the times are listed on the door of my room. You just 
write your name in a time slot. Uh, but I would point out that the appointment slots get booked up quite quickly. If it's urgent, catching me between sessions is the best idea. That way we can sort something out quickly. Um, no questions? Before the talk continues, look at questions 14 to 20. As you listen to the second part of the talk, answer the questions. For questions 14 to 19, circle the correct letter, A, B or C. For question 20, write no more than three words for the answer. OK. As regards you as students, the tutorials are voluntary. You're not obliged to attend, but you are encouraged to do so. Last year, for the first time, a register was kept of students attending lectures and this year tutors are being asked to keep a register of tutorial attendance. This is not a formal register and not all tutors will be doing it, but in the philosophy department all of us have chosen to keep registers. Another point that's being emphasised this year is punctuality. When we did exit questionnaires, we found that people arriving late for tutorials and lectures was the single most annoying thing for the majority of students. Mm. I would therefore ask you to try to be on time for the tutorials, mm. and for all your other classes for that matter. Mm -hmm. As regards the tutorials themselves, we will have a review of the philosophy lectures of the week before, with the discussion being led by one of you each week. There is, of course, some planning involved, but you should rely primarily on the notes you made at the lectures. This will not take up the whole of the 90 minutes allocated to the tutorial. For the rest of the time, we will look at a particular philosopher, period or concept for which you will be expected to do some preparation each week. This will range from reading about a particular individual or concept to preparing a brief outline on a subject of your choice. How much you put into this depends on you, but we're not expecting in-depth analysis at this stage. Um, are there any questions so far? I'd just like to ask whether the work we do in the tutorials counts towards our continuous assessment, and if so, how much? I was just coming on to that point. All the work you do in the way of essays and project work that is graded counts towards your continuous assessment grades. The mini presentations and lecture discussions will not be graded, but obviously, as time goes on, these activities will, I hope, have an impact on your work and hence your scores. Does that answer your question? Basically, yes. But what about... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You are going to listen to a conversation between two students about preparing a questionnaire as part of an essay assignment. First, look at questions 21 to 24. As you listen, answer the questions. 
I've never written an essay of more than 1,500 words before, Anne. Me neither, Mark, and it scares me. Ah, I wouldn't worry. We'll just have to pretend it's four essays of 1,500 words and join them together. <laughs> it says here in the assignment notes Dr Brightwell gave us that we're to write between 5,000 and 6,000 words on some aspect of students' attitudes, backed up by our own research, which we present in the form of tables, graphs, charts or whatever, and supported by reference to the list of books she gave us. Oh, I didn't realise there had been so many social science books written about students. Oh, yeah. There are a lot. Mm. And the questionnaire? Yes. Um, we have to... Um, prepare a questionnaire to gather our own data for the graphs, etc., and hand it in to Dr Brightwell in draft form in um, two weeks' time. Two weeks? That's what she said, and what it says here. She says that it's better to have it checked before we go on to collect the information and start the writing. Mm, suppose she's right. We'd better get started then. But she didn't say how we were going to put the questionnaire together. Does it say anything in the notes? Uh, nope. It only says that we are limited to four sides of A4 and no more than 50 questions. Mm. Mm. If that's the case, it's not that bad. Before the conversation continues, look at questions 25 to 30. For questions 25 to 30, match the points mentioned in the table to the speaker. Circle M for Mark or A for Anne. So, how are we going to do it? Well, first we need to know who we're aiming it at. Then decide how many questions we're going to ask. I think we could have about 40 questions maximum. I don't think there's any real need to go up to the 50 limit. Mm. And I think we should keep the questions themselves very simple. <laughs> don't worry. In my case, they will be. <laughs> <laughs> we could have a mixture of question types, like multiple choice questions. Yes, no, and agree, disagree, with boxes for people to tick. Mm -hmm. If people are asked to write down anything, it's unlikely they will fill it in. So... Are we going to give this questionnaire out to people to hand in or are we going to just stop and ask them around the campus or on the street? Mm, I don't really know. Did she say anything about this? Um, no, she didn't. And there is nothing in these notes she gave us either. I think we ought to give them out. OK. Anyway, it won't affect the way we design the questionnaire. We're both doing it on different subjects, but there's nothing wrong with pooling our ideas about the mechanism of the questionnaire. No, none. What are you doing your project on? I've been thinking about doing something around the subject of um, how aware students are of world affairs. People think that we're all up to date, but I very much doubt it. Hmm. It would also be interesting to compare students in different years. And you? I'm doing something on health and sport and whether students are more or less active since they came to university. Oh, sounds interesting. As the questionnaires can be anonymous, I'll fill in your first questionnaire for you. But I'm sure you won't be surprised by my answers. <laughs> Somehow, I don't think so. <laughs> I suggest we put together about 20 or 25 questions each and then meet tomorrow or the day after and compare them. Mm -hmm. Are you going to type yours up? Yeah, then I can come round to your place and we can work on them. You've got a laptop, haven't you? Yes, and I've got some new design software so we can play around with the layout. Brilliant. Are you any good at doing charts and things? I know how to do simple things on the computer, but we'll sort something out. OK. 
I feel much better about all this now. It doesn't seem quite as bad as I first thought. No, don't worry, we'll get it done. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four. Part four. You are going to hear a talk on the writer Charles Dickens, given by a university lecturer to a group of students. First, look at questions 31 to 35. Note the example that has been done for you. As you listen to the first part of the talk, tick the appropriate box for questions 31 to 35. Good morning. My name is Professor Sarah Lennon, and I'm here today to talk to you about the works of one of the greatest writers in the English language, Charles Dickens. He wrote many books, and if we bear in mind that there are over 2,000 characters in his stories, we can get an idea of the complexity of his work. I've selected one novel from your reading list that I would like to talk about to illustrate his genius, namely Dombey and Son. But before we look at this work in earnest, I thought it might be a good idea to have a quick look at his life and also at a few of the major events that happened during his lifetime so that we can try to put his writing into perspective. Dickens was born on the 7th of February, 1812, at the time when his father was working in Portsmouth Dockyard. His father was transferred to London in 1814. To help give us a picture of the time Dickens was born into, it's worth noting that in 1814, when Dickens was two, the first efficient steam locomotive was constructed in Newcastle-upon-Tyne. Then, in 1817, the year that Queen Victoria was born and Waterloo Bridge in London was opened, the Dickens family moved away from London. And to give Dickens' life a literary perspective, in the following year, works by other famous English writers were published. Jane Austen's Northanger Abbey and Persuasion, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, and Scott's The Heart of Midlothian. When Dickens was almost ten, his family circumstances changed, and in 1822 the family moved back to London. In 1824, John Dickens was arrested for debt and imprisoned in the Marshalsea, near London Bridge, in London. This event had a profound effect on Dickens' writing. From 1827, Charles Dickens had various jobs as solicitor's clerk, freelance reporter and newspaper reporter. Before the speaker continues the talk, look at questions 36 to 40.
As you listen to the second part of the talk, answer the questions. For questions 36 and 37, circle the correct answer. For questions 38 to 40, write no more than three words or a number for each answer. In December 1833, Dickens had his first story, A Dinner at Poplar Wall, published in The Monthly Magazine. In the same year, the SS Royal William became the first vessel to cross the Atlantic Ocean by steam alone. In 1836, two important events happened. Dickens published the first series of sketches by Boz, and the publishers, Chapman and Hall, suggested his first novel, The Pickwick Papers. In April of the same year, the second major event took place. Dickens married Catherine Hogarth. And in 1837, the year that Queen Victoria became Queen of England and Samuel B. Morse developed Telegraph, the novel Oliver Twist began publication in Bentley's Miscellany in 24 monthly instalments. You may not be aware that serialization like this was common in Dickens' time. In the subsequent year, that is, in 1838, the serialization of Nicholas Nickleby started and appeared in 20 instalments. Dickens' novel, The Old Curiosity Shop, began serialization in 1840. This was the year the first postage stamp, the Penny Post, was brought in by Rowland Hill, and the year the first bicycle was produced. The next major publication for Dickens was in 1842, when the first part of Martin Chuzzlewit appeared, and in 1848, Dombey and Son was published. Now, uh, do you have any questions before we go on to look at this work in some depth? No? That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.